Thank you guys all for joining us. I'm sorry if anybody's watching this recorded and is bummed out that they couldn't get into the link, but at least you'll get some of the great content and um, messages that we are gonna talk about. I mean, one thing that happens with SKU is you touch all of these young brands and they're trying to figure out how to reach their customer in the most effective way. And as consumers are being bombarded with messages, I mean, you have to really understand the systems and the hacks to make the most bang for your marketing bucks. And so we are covering all that today. And so we have two wonderful SKU alumni, um, Ruth Marriott from A Pub Above and Sean Riley from Dude Wipes, and then three experts in um, in marketing. We've got Carolyn Lowe, a mentor for SKU um, and the founder and CEO of ROI Swift, a digital marketing group. We have Tracy Wallace, a content marketing specialist and VP of marketing for Market Hire, and Sean Donovan, founder and CEO of Antidote, which is email marketing. So with that, we're going to kick it off. I mean, Sean, you went through SKU, I think track two in Austin. And you have grown Dude Wipes to such an epic place. So tell us about Dude Wipes and, and kind of where you're at right now as a business. Yeah, for sure. Um, can you guys hear me all right? Cool. Yeah, so, so we started Dude Wipes uh, in 2012 uh, when we kind of got our first batch of products. So you know, bootstrapped company, just a couple of guys with, with no experience in e-commerce or CPG or really anything, put together $30,000 of our own money and thought, you know, that the toilet paper industry um, could be disrupted um, with a flushable wipe. So we make these, these wipes that are better than toilet paper. And our first one was just a little individually wrapped uh, dude wipe that you could fit in your pocket. I got some of... Uh, some of the V1 stuff here in my office. So this was our first product and it was just a box of 30 dude wipes. And, you know, we only had one skew for, uh, you know, for the first two years of the business and um, just were kind of getting the brand in people's hands, um, you know, learning everything as we went along and, and reinvesting, you know, everything back into the company. So um, yeah, definitely not like, like most company stories, you know, no, um, no seed round or, or capital to get it off the ground or experience or anything like that. So just uh, really, you know, we were a brand first company, we built a brand that like meant something and, and was fun to the category and was really going to punch people between the eyes and, you know, not something everybody loves, um, but, but something that a lot of people, you know, can get passionate and, and have fun behind. So, um, yeah, I mean, when, when we did SKU, we were actually, you know, really, um, you know, we had like $10,000 in sales or something like that. So, um, definitely very early company and, and didn't really catch the eyes of any investors, but, you know, just decided that we were going to, you know, put the, put the pedal down and, and give it a go. And, you know, slowly, but surely, you know, one year you make 100,000, the next year you make 200,000. And we just kind of started doubling the business year over year. And, and those numbers, you know, started adding up and, and then, uh, you know, did some things like shark tank, um, get, got into kind of national retailers and, and really built the business um, on Amazon as well in those early days before the retailers would take our calls. Um, that was kind of our first million dollar customer. So all along the way, just, just having fun, being, being authentic, you know, to who we are as we grow is, is very important. And, uh, and, you know, doing a lot of viral marketing stunts and, and everything like that uh, to, to gain buzz around the brand without the capital, especially in the early days, really just sampling, getting product in people's hands and trying to do, you know, fun viral marketing was, was really all we could, uh, could afford. So yeah, here we are today, you know, um, over hundreds of millions of dollars in sales since, uh, you know, that skew $10,000 year and uh, just, just rocking and rolling and just doubling down. Big, uh, big focus guy. So everybody tells us along the way, what else are you gonna do? What should you do next? And I would just tell anybody, if you're in a market where there's growth ahead of you, um, diversifying yourself is only gonna split up your capital, split up your energy, split up your marketing budget. So, you know, we are less than 1% of the US $10 billion toilet paper. Like 
I don't need to worry shit about what comes next. I just need to keep doubling down and growing and building, you know, this brand in this category. So, um, you know, I think a lot of the Harvard MBAs and the PE people, they always want the brand to platform. But if you're in a category where you have growth, I, I'm an anti um, platforming the brand guy. If your category doesn't have growth and your growth starts to slow, slow with your brand, um, then you have to look at platforming. But uh, and I've made the mistakes. I just cut all our deodorants, you know, this year, last year, we were like, oh, we should get into do deodorant. And it was a stupid idea. And, and I'm responsible for that stupid idea. But, uh, you know, it, it let us really like learn and double down that uh, we need to be great at one thing and be the Kleenex of this category, which we're kind of like well on our way to doing. So, yeah, that's a little bit, a uh, little bit of my story and a little bit of my spiel on, on focus. Uh, so, yeah, nice to meet everybody. Well, I love the story, the trajectory and just the focus. So when you were a $10,000 company, I mean, what was your market? marketing strategy and how has it grown and iterated as different marketing channels have opened up and you know you have additional products and of course additional capital to to spend on your marketing yeah so so early on sampling was like our biggest marketing thing so you know i definitely tell if you can get product into people's hands like a there's going to be a word of mouth, which word of mouth still remains king, you know, on, with everything digital these days, like people using and talking about your product and telling their friends is, is how all companies get started. And it's still how we grow. So, you know, getting that product in people's hands. And then uh, on like the technical side, as we started scaling on Amazon, we started executing the advertising on there um, kind of religiously. And every month as we grew, we used a percentage of revenue that went back into that flywheel. Um, and that's definitely something, um, you know, in, in terms of focusing on your key customers that we've learned over the years. Um, like if you're growing on Amazon, like keep growing on there and keep feeding that flywheel with marketing budget, trade marketing, like under their roof. So if you get into Target, you know, figure out, okay, what programs can I spend at Target that are going to grow it? So, you know, a percentage of our revenue at big customers goes right back into that customer's ecosystem. And then we use another percentage to grow the brand and do, you know, fun content and sponsor NASCARs and stuff like that. So we're like, very disciplined on the, you know, growing with our customers. And uh, Amazon was the first thing that opened our eyes to that. We started seeing exponential growth on there and it was directly um, related to the marketing we were pumping back into the platform. So I always tell people don't expect to list your product on Shopify or on Amazon or for anybody to buy it. Um, cause, cause you need to be spending money to get it in front of them. Well, I think you've kind of answered a bit of my next question about just the most effective tools that you use. Um, I love the strategic um, kind of funnel of marketing dollars back into your core customers, but is there any other effective tools that you've used, maybe low cost and a different channel, more creative to, to gain new awareness of your products as I know sampling for a lot of people has been hard, especially during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Sampling and like e-commerce platforms, if you don't have something like an ice cream or something that's like going to melt um, is, is big opportunity. So there's, you know, all the big boys kind of have programs where you can be in the e-commerce bags and add inserts and stuff. Um, and then, you know, what's free is organic social. And so that's another thing we do well. And it's just a super long grindy game. You got to be in it every day for five years, you know, before you kind of see the community build. And, but, you know, um, nobody in the toilet paper industry has more followers than us combined, actually. So Cottonelle, Charmin, Quilted Northern, Angel Soft, we have more followers than all of them combined. And like, we're authentically talking to those people through DMs and, connecting with them and posting every day. So that's like a super long game. Like obviously when we started, you know, we were getting one like on things and stuff like that. Um, but you just have to like stay in it and add value. Our thing is humor, poop humor, stuff like that. So like, don't always trying to be selling people what you're doing, you know, like have a shtick, 
um, which, which all comes from knowing your brand and like knowing who you are and your why and everything. Like if that's nailed, then like have that shtick and just, you know, spin it out on organic social, respond to everybody's DMs, send people product for their charity outings and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, that is kind of a, a nice fortress for us now, our organic social, where we can like make announcements and, you know, ha have like a nice following. I mean, it's still, it still can be a lot bigger, um, but it's all like real followers that we've built up over time. So we're de definitely happy with, you know, where it's came. That's amazing. Um, and it's that personal touch that when engaging the customer that creates that stickiness I found, which increases velocity and just kind of keeps the whole organization moving forward. So how did that NASCAR car um, turn out for you? Is there anything that you've done marketing wise that hasn't worked? Yeah, I mean, um, NASCAR for us is a way to get in front of like our Walmart crowd. And, and so Walmart's a big customer of ours. Um, you know some some like early on definitely we spent too much money like being at a music festival with like a tent and stuff like that and like that just wasn't an effective spend of revenue for how many people we were touching we would have been better off spending that money on amazon ads so like it took us a little bit to um understand the balance you know between effectiveness and uh and kind of brand building so um, but, but then once you find that balance, you can get more aggressive with the brand building stuff and like, you know, X percent of your marketing budget, you should not really be trying to track. It should be like top of funnel brand awareness. Okay. So smart. Which is an ass part for us, you know, like. Yeah. Okay. So you've had a lot of success with social media and you've cracked the nut at how to go viral. Can you share some of your recent successes? Yeah, I think our biggest recent one is when we put uh, during the Jake Paul, um, you know, the biggest pay-per-view boxing event of the year, we put dude wipes on the ass of Tyron Woodley, who was fighting um, Jake Paul. And, you know, that went completely viral online, you know, hundreds of millions of impressions. And uh, that was uh, definitely something we've learned. Like, that's just like a weird contextual thing with people's brains, like, that you have to figure out if your brand, but if we put dude wipes on someone's ass, you get it right away. This is a butt wipe. This is hilarious. And like that creates that like virality. So, you know, we, we look for opportunities like that when we can get in a big, in front of a big audience and do kind of a stunt like that and essentially kind of like take over, you know, the social commentary about the fight is now like dude wipes is, you know, trending on Twitter and is like just as talked about as kind of the fight and then the, the billboard and platforming in front of like everybody's face. So that was our biggest, uh, like by far, like success of the year. And uh, yeah, every, you know, every year or so we have something that just goes completely um, parabolic, you know, in terms of the reach. Um, but then, you know, we have fun things like, like we were talking about videos on TikTok where we're just working with small creators and they're doing things really like visually intense and fun. And, and our advantage of being the small brand is like, we're not really trying to regulate like what they put out. Like here's our brand, go put something out. Like if it goes viral, you know, great. You know, if it doesn't, it, we're usually only spending 500 bucks or something like that. So yeah, we're taking a lot of those smaller shots too. And, and that's one thing you have to realize too, like, you know, for every 10 of those you take, you know, one of them goes off for 5 million views and a lot of them won't. So it's kind of a, a volume game um, in that kind of like micro influencer virality, but we definitely have learned like, and that comes with doubling down on dude wipes, like, talk about dude wipes talk about poop like it's all about like focusing and knowing like what works whereas like when we were more wide um we didn't really have like a concentrated message for these people to tell and now we do and it's super simple and you know and we're essentially we're just going at big toilet paper so we kind of like have an enemy too um which is kind of fun and, and it's good for marketing too to kind of say this is the big guy you know so speaking to that, we have a question that came in that is talking about how you're competing with such major um, CPG incumbents, right? Um, you said you're like 1% of the market within kind of toilet paper. 
Have you found that Amazon ads are effective given the fact you're playing with some um, really, really large competitors? Yes. Um, well, I will say when we were starting on Amazon, those people did not care about Amazon. So we were like the new heads on the block, understanding that this was like a big channel that needed to be invested in. And so we kind of had a couple year head start on big toilet paper on Amazon. And now um, in our category of flushable wipes, we're just as big as Cottonelle. So like, that's not the case in retail yet. Um, but yeah, now essentially we have just as big of a war chest <laughs> to fight them. Um, but you still can compete on there, like in your early days, um, if you have like a different, it all comes down to differentiated product and product positioning. So like no amount of digital ads and can save anybody, you know, like the tobacco industry spent a billion dollars, you know, marketing a smokeless cigarette like 10 years ago and it flopped. So like, don't think about, you know, positioning and uniqueness to the customer and the category is what burrs all opportunity. And if you do that, your digital ads will be effective. If you make something that's not unique or doesn't add enough value to the customer, yeah, the big guys are going to squash you. But if you're just different and unique and you're talking to different people or you're offering a different value, you know, you're, the algorithm is going to realize that in your ads. Okay. So so much information there. I think um, this is fantastic. So thank you so much for coming on and talking about your story. Um, I, right now, I'm going to switch it over to Tracy Wallace. So she is a content marketing specialist and VP of marketing for Marketer Hire. And you have been um, such a friend of SKU, always brilliant in your words. So tell us a little bit about your experience within content marketing. Yeah, for sure. So hi, everybody. I am Tracy Wallace. As y'all heard, I work over at a company called Marketer Hire, which is place you can go and hire freelance marketers um, that are that are pre-vetted, so that's helpful. But I also come to the direct-to-consumer world through big commerce, where I was the editor-in-chief for five years, interviewed a bunch of startup founders about what the heck is actually working, why, how can other people replicate it. I also have my own D2C brand. It's called Dora Sleep. Um, and for that, all I do is content marketing. Um, it's the only thing I invest in, mostly because it's a side project um, and I know how to do content marketing and I'm not so good at like advertising um, and all of all, all the all the stuff that comes with that. So uh, that's my background. And then in terms of content marketing and you know trying to get programs set up prior to the holidays, which like people like we're in the holidays right now, people are buying. Um, so what, what can you do? My biggest advice uh, that I wanted to get on here and talk to everybody about was to focus on local content marketing, like starting today. I mean, if you can start to get stuff up by next week, that would be really helpful. What I mean by local content marketing, there's, there's, two, there's a few different things. So one is creating um, like you know, where to shop in your area, pieces of content, right? So I'm in Austin, Texas. So highlighting, you know, your own products, even seeing if you can build partnership with some brick and mortar stores. Why am I even suggesting that? And it's because uh, the supply chain is really backed up. I'm sure there's people in here right now who are having trouble with their own supply chain. You aren't alone. Um, everybody is, or, or quite a few people are. A lot of consumers, um, I mean, that, that news has gotten out to a lot of consumers and a lot of consumers as a result are going to be shopping a lot more in store this year, maybe than uh, online, because that is the most surefire way to make sure that you have gifts, you know, under the tree or, or for Hanukkah or, or, or whatever, whatever have you. Um, so it's really smart right now as a direct-to-consumer brand, if you can go out and make some partnerships with some of those brick and mortar stores, whether that's getting your product in those stores or even just getting some like flyers and cards about your product and brand within those stores, 
you certainly want to make sure that it's a complimentary store uh, to, to the, the products that you're selling, but you can also do this online, right? So creating gift guides, um, gift guides always do really well, whether you are just promoting that on social into your audience or an email, you should do both of those things, but creating kind of um, a curated list for folks. And you can do this multiple times, right? You can create a curated list for your local area. You can create a curated list and ideas for women, for men, for your dad, for your boy, like what, whatever, whatever might make the most sense for, for your target segments. And then again, start doing that right now. You can then extend that from your individual like blog posts into Pinterest posts. You can reach out to the other brands that you have included in there, tagging them on social, even reaching out to them over email, letting them know, you know, hey, we've included y'all, would love to help promote and even see if they're up for partnership opportunities, which would be really fantastic. Uh, so that's, again, last minute content marketing and SEO typically takes um, to like really build a moat around your brand, typically takes anywhere from six months to a year to really start to pay off. So what can you do in terms of content now to start to, to see some lift in time for the holidays? It's really, really focusing on what that audience need is, which is trying to find those gifts and those products um, in time for the holidays. Yeah, I love that. Um, I was back home in Minneapolis a couple of months ago, and there's this great like kind of curated Galleria mall, and they had Enneagram type products and stores within the mall of like where to shop. (laughs) And I just, I I followed it because I'm like, oh, I know that person. Like we just sit around at dinner and talk about it. She's like an eight, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Right. Um, It's that personal touch that I think is so important. Um, So how can um, consumer or I'm sorry, um, companies really use their content to get more PR? To get more PR, it's a great question. So right now, there are a lot of uh, reporters out there. So I'm sure everybody has heard of Caro. That's help a reporter out. Definitely respond to those that reporters use it. There's also uh, a new one out there called help a B2B reporter out. So definitely look that one up. That will get you featured on sites like Shopify, Marketer Hire, like hashtag paid, All of that is really, really helpful for you as well because B2B marketers or people who are looking for B2B software also are buyers because they are people. Um, And sometimes it can be far easier to get in those sites um, or to be covered by those blogs. You can also follow um, like direct to consumer writers um, for B2B sites. There's a woman named uh, Kaylee Moore who writes for a bunch of different brands. She is always looking to cover like what companies are doing for the holidays, for their overall strategies, all of that jazz. Like I'm going to be doing one with her for door sleep, um, like like in a couple of weeks, which will be great. Um, so, so using content ultimately, like how, how can it help you get PR is, is by talking to these people, right? So make sure that you're reaching out to them. Make sure that you are on top of Harrow. Make sure that you are on top of that B2B, help, help a B2B reporter out and make sure that you are out there just scouring, you know, Twitter. These people are looking for direct-to-consumer brands to cover and they want to cover them before anybody else does. So they want the, those up-and-comers. Um, so you have a really good chance of getting covered if you can get in front of them, even just replying to them on Twitter, getting in their DMs. And then of course, in terms of content and SEO, that can really help you long-term because you're getting on Shopify's blog, clearly, of course, getting on, you know, like a a major media sites, uh, getting in an article there ultimately helps build up your backlink profile, increase your domain ranking. All of that's really important for you producing content, you know, say in 2022. So that come this time next year, you're already driving a bunch of organic traffic to your site and you aren't, you know, having to think, okay, what can I do that has something to do with content really quickly to see, to see if I could get some results. Please put some of those um, specific places <laughs> and sites in the chat feature so we can Okay, perfect. I'm Googling them right now. Okay, so any ideas on creative um, ad campaigns that you've seen? Let's just get like the juices rolling for the companies that are on this call. Uh, for, for creative ad campaigns, oh my goodness. Um, well, so 
going back to, to what Sean was saying, I mean, TikTok seems to be working incredibly well for brands right now, and that's organic TikTok. So my team over at Marketer Hire has interviewed a bunch of different brands um, and, and marketers who have been trying to do TikTok ads, and they just seem not to work as well. Um, so organic TikTok is working really well. Um, you can still get a pretty good bang for your buck over on Snapchat, as well as on Pinterest. And Pinterest is even beginning to uh, add, you know, like, like more shoppable features where people don't even necessarily need to leave Pinterest to buy. So, and so that, that that's where I would start is trying to figure out, okay, how can I use some of these platforms that are either up and coming and up and coming platforms are typically the best to start to use. Again, as Sean was saying, you can spend a small amount of money there and get a big lift. Now that can be challenging. It can be scary. It's new. You're going to have to test a variety of things out, but early adopters get the best rates um, and you want the best rates as you're trying to grow your business. And then of course, just looking to other platforms and channels that other people aren't spending as much money or time on. Again, Snapchat, Pinterest, there's a lot of consumers over on those channels and not a lot of people uh, spending a ton of money over there. I love it. All really practical tips. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. You're welcome. Um, and then if anyone's um, interested in TikTok, I mean, they have a huge presence here in Austin and um, a woman that we've been working with at SKU for years has like moved around from WeWork and she's landed at TikTok and all she work is working on is emerging brands. So we have a really good personal um, connection to somebody there. So if anybody wants that, please reach out and we'll connect you with Hannah. Cause I know TikTok is just, I mean, I can't figure it out, but everybody <laughs> else really likes it. I love it. It's um, great. I am <laughs> dropping some of these links in, into the chat for everyone. Thank you. Here too. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to remind everyone, apparently there was just a little bit of an event snafu. We're recording this. So we're going to be pumping it out. If you missed the first half, you know, you'll, you'll be able to watch it and make sure you've got all of these great um, little bits of wisdom. So with that being said, I am going to move on to Ruth Marriott, um, the founder of A Pup Above, a SKU alumni company. Ruth, tell us a little bit about your company and especially how it is um, relates to the marketing strategies you've used. Hi hey everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Ruth Marriott. I started the company with my husband and also our dog, Lola. Um, so she's the inspiration behind it. Uh, we sell a fresh frozen uh, dog food line. It's sold in pet uh, specialty retailers across the country and then also online as well. Um, similar to Sean, we also went through SKU um, back in 2019. And I would say at that time, we were still trying to figure out where to focus our efforts in terms of channel strategy and marketing and messaging. Um, since then, you know, we've had a lot of benefits from focusing on the customer we're targeting um, and also the products we're replacing. And that's allowed us to really focus in um, and make decisions on where to where to invest time and resources and where to not. Um, that's been, I would say, a big advantage in spending like our money more effectively. I love it. So when we're talking about marketing tools, I mean, what has been the most effective for you? Just because the product you're putting out there is so unique. It's not just like another new dog food brand. It's found in the frozen section. It's going to be yeah. a specialty retailer. So I feel like there was education over your product and what it was, as well as education around how to get your, you know, the consumer's hands. Yeah. On. Yeah. So we have uh, kind of two different um, things at, at retail level. The pet stores we sell into have really well educated store employees. So we actually really cater to them in terms of providing education and resources and marketing efforts to them uh, so that they can market to the consumers that come in. Um, you know, people there either get food recommendations from their vet or a lot of times these store employees. Uh, so marketing to them is, is very important for us. 
So we have an online training program with different modules where if they pass each module, they get different prizes. And so we really try hard to connect with them on an emotional level too, um, because if they emotionally like the brand, they're gonna be more likely to recommend the product uh, to the customers that come in. And then online, um, we have um, seen a lot of good uh, progress with getting um, micro influencers to post about our product, review our product, talk about it. Um, that does really well in ads as well because it's more authentic. And then us versus them online and also in retail works extremely well uh, because it communicates what you're replacing, which focuses your messaging. Um, that does well in both places. It basically helps the person make the decision and understand why they should care about your product. So I want to go a little deeper into that. Um, there's a lot of options when it comes to dog food, right? And you talked so much about getting both like, you know, the store employees educated and having that emotional connection as well as the customers. Like, tell us specifically what you're doing to really um, create that sort of engagement? Um, is it visuals? Is it content? Is it, you know, yeah. some, some of the reward systems? It's, um, it's both. So visual, people want to see that their dog likes the food because people are not tasting the food themselves, right? So they need to know that their dog's going to love it. So we have a lot of content around dogs dancing for meal time, getting super pumped. Um, and then the, their pet, you know, the pet parent will get really excited because their dog's excited. So communicating that is really important because most people's biggest question if they're buying online is how do I know my dog will like it? Um, so that's a big, uh, that's kind of the big question to answer for our online um, efforts. And then at the store level, store employees will be like, my dog's obsessed with this product. They love it. So again, it's just having a person communicate uh, to someone either digitally or in person, how much their dog really likes the product and why, why they like it, which is what you can get across through UGC really well if you're doing it digitally too. I see some questions coming in on the chat. So how challenging was the education aspect, getting the word out about a cold dog food? Um, so the category itself is the fastest growing category in pet foods. So we certainly have other players in the market that are spending their own advertising dollars that are helping grow the category as a whole. Um, so right, being in a category that's growing uh, certainly helps. Um, and then in terms of education, that's also why it's important we sell into pet stores because their store employees do such a good job and we don't have to, to pay for that education. We just have to get them to take our training, which is online. So it's a super cost effective way to educate people. Um, we also do a lot with email, uh, social and our blog, so SEO uh, to drive traffic to the sites. A lot of people are trying to figure out dog food. They have a lot of bigger questions about how they feed their dog. And so that can bring them to the site and then also potentially become a customer that way as well. All right. I love it. Okay. So one last question for you, and it's such a great question for you, Ruth, just knowing you um, from the SKU program and how your brain works. I mean, you are very tactical when it comes to just analyzing your business, getting down to the core aspects, whether it's operations, but I'm sure you're applying it to marketing as well. So how are you making sure that you're spending your dollars in the most effective way? Yeah, so there's actually a, a new tool that's been really helpful for that. It's called Triple Whale. It plugs into your Shopify account and then all the places you're advertising. So Google, Facebook, and you can see it all in one dashboard, the ROAS for each channel. Um, it'll tell your acquisition cost, your new customer acquisition cost. Um, so you can see everything in one place very easily. Um, and then another thing is just having like KPIs that are um, KPIs that you can hold people accountable to. So it's helpful to talk to other brands, maybe in your category or similar categories to figure out what that should be. Like what should, what percentage of revenue should come from email? Um, what should your ROAS on Facebook be? And then use something like triple wheel um, to see if you're hitting it. And if you're not, then you know you need to change things 
and you know you need to cha change things with that tool. If it's email that's not working, if it's Facebook that's not working, because ultimately everything's working together. You can't just really scale through one method anymore these days. Um, it all has to be working together. Well, just like I asked Tracy, throw that in the chat feature. You know, yeah. triple yeah. whale is what I heard, and it sounds like such a great tool to use. So, yeah. and then Carol and Lo, just through another one in the chat. So definitely look those up. Thank you, thank you, Ruth. I'm gonna move this along to Carolyn, um, who is one of our dear SKU mentors and the founder and CEO of ROI Swift, a digital marketing agency. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do at ROI and just start doing what you do, which is being the guru in this space. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've, um, I, I think everybody has really touched on some of the most important things you, you can't do is you can't do anything in a vacuum. So um, I love the way that Sean talked about how sampling is very important. We have a saying that anything that goes on your skin or in your mouth has to be sampled. Um, so obviously your pet too, you know, obviously that's why Ruth is having such great success with in-store and educating in-store. So depending on what type of brand you are, sampling is, is critical. Um, I, and I love the way that Sean is using humor. Um, we focus just on paid. So I am the sort of yin to Tracy's yang there. Um, she, everything to do with SEO or content, I was like, go talk to Tracy. On the paid side, um, I think we're seeing some really interesting things. Um, so we just do Facebook advertising, Google, Microsoft, um, and we run Amazon for brands and, and um, email marketing. So those are the things that um, we're seeing right away. And I know I'm gonna leave all the good stuff for Sean at Antidote to talk email marketing, but on the paid side, I'm sure all of, you know, most folks, unless you're completely insane, you're feeling the um, effects of iOS ports and you knew from before is no longer true, especially for those highly mobile brands. So there's a couple things that we recommend every brand do right off the bat, um, especially if you're on Shopify. So make sure you have conversion API set up, make sure you have aggregated event manager set up and tracking. So um, make sure all of those things, make sure those are set to maximum just to, because there is gonna be some data loss. You have to sort of do things a little bit differently. And I know, um, we talked a little bit about user-generated content. Um, a lot of times I don't see people social proof their ads. So social proof is where you basically say, you, if you're going out to a new audience, like a top of funnel audience, what you'll do is you'll put that ad that is brand new, it has no engagement on it. And then you, wouldn't, you wanna go out to your, your page fans or your purchasers, get them to love on it. Because as you know, you see your feed, and you've never heard of it. And you're like, hmm. but if you see like 50 people saying, this is the best dog food ever. This is the, these are the best wipes ever. My butt never felt so great. You know, then it, you as a, as a new customer coming in, who've never heard of dude wipes are like, wow, this is, this is terrific. Maybe I should check this out. Right. And then you move them down the funnel. So versus just going out with cold traffic with like a, an ad that has no engagement. Um, they don't know, you know, there, there's no credibility. It's like trying to buy something on Amazon that has three reviews. You're like, mm, is this product legit or not? So definitely we're seeing a lot of good stuff in social proofing. Um, and, and so that concept was called Wait, so is that social? Process? Social proofing. Mm -hmm. Okay, social proofing. Yeah. I love it. So you get the good mm -hmm. ad, yeah. you send it to your core customer base, you get the likes, you get the love, and then you're pushing it out to a broader audience. Exactly, you're pushing okay. out to your top of funnel audience. So um, social proof is a good way to just sort of um, get folks to engage. And then also when that ad has a lot of engagement, Facebook loves it because it's got a lot of engagement. Um, so we, uh, we definitely wanna do that. You definitely wanna do that. And in the chat, uh, blog conversion. Okay, you're cutting in and out just a little bit, Carol. Guys. So we're doing that with a lot of folks now. 
Um, okay, just cut out for one second. So okay. what you said was you're definitely working around the KPIs, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, no, I said definitely if you want to check out um, how to set up conversion chat link in here with a blog post on our site for to walk you through what is conversion and how do you set it up if you don't already have it running. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. So this is one thing you were incredibly helpful on and all of the companies that you mentored and were engaged with um, at SKU is with a limited budget, where should founders focus on early? If it's really limited and, and, and Sean did the same thing and I always say focus on organic social, get yourself a really passionate person, a $15, you know, an hour intern, 10 hours a week that really just starts building up your social that is phenomenal at TikTok, you know, um, and, and put some humor. Like Sean said, we see the things that are either memes or humor. Those really tend to do well. Um, and you're right about organic TikTok. Organic TikTok algorithm is really much better than the paid algorithm right now. So um, it, it's just got so much great data in there. So I would say Put your money on some of those micro influencers, um, you know, like Richard and get someone on your team doing it and, and not a PR agency. So, you know, you really want someone on your team and um, have a scorecard for them, right? What's their metric? How many, how many people posted for them? Use some of the tools, right? And so you can track that. We have a scorecard metric for our company every week and we track certain things. And it's like, it, you know, when I was at Dell, we used to always say, if you can measure it, you can manage it. So figure out everything can be managed, figure out what you're, what you're going to manage. Start with sampling, right? Especially if you're a food and beverage company or a consumable company. And then, um, you know, we did this with a natural cleaning company that was in a town hall once is if you're, if you're a product like a dude wipes, that's going to get subscriptions or that's going to have high repeat purchase. Um, really sort of invest in that advertising on the, on the front end and, and don't, you know, hold yourself to everything has to be profitable from day one. If you've got a little bit of cash in the bank, um, we did that with the brand. And, and when they, once they got to Amazon and they were now getting over hundred percent conversion rate, they had more subscribing saves um, than they had people coming to their page. So they were basically getting that sort of auto free money. So I'm, I'm all about that sort of early investment. But if you don't have a lot of money, do what these amazing people like Ruth and Sean did work on sampling, work on your organic stuff, and then jump into paid once you start having enough of a, a customer data and enough of, you know, usually a thousand customers or so is where, you know, it makes sense to jump into paid. I love it. Okay. And just for anyone, I feel like we've got the whole intern game down at SKU. So reach out to us if you need some help with that. I mean, um, we've got great people, um, across a lot of different universities, but like UT has always just like a steady pipeline of um, great interns for us that are so excited they can crank out Instagram in their sleep and get so many followers. So yes. And uh, I remember okay. when Michelle talked to me about that, like almost two years ago when, you know, you guys had a very small social, you know, program. And I remember Michelle and I were on the phone and I was like, yeah, just go to UT, go to hire a Longhorn. And, you know, we always had amazing interns from UT, $15 an hour. They get amazing experience. They build an amazing network. Um, so it's, it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, so definitely utilize that. Um, okay, what are some things to avoid? Um, things that can eat up a lot of money or take longer to see results. You know, where what shiny object or rabbit hole should companies just not, not chase down? Well, you know, Tracy and I, I'm going to agree to disagree. I, I agree with Tracy on organic Pinterest is great. It's free traffic. You can post stuff there. Um, paid Pinterest. I, I was one of the first people on the paid Pinterest platform in like 2014. Um, and Paid Pinterest, people get frustrated because it, it takes a little longer. You know, they're not immediate sales like Facebook or TikTok or Amazon, I mean, Amazon or anything like that. So it's a longer payback. People will pin stuff and maybe come back to it. And so, you know, people get frustrated with, with Pinterest and they're, 
their targeting is nowhere near as good as say a Google or, um, or a Facebook. So Pinterest paid is something we typically stay a little bit away from because it takes a longer time. It's not as effective. You can get better ROI on other places. So that's one place where, you know, we've seen, we worked with a boot company and they had 2000 people pin something, but you know, 30 days later, nobody, nobody had bought anything. So um, I'm a big fan of organic Pinterest. I'm also a big fan of doing all those shopping feeds. So um, I think Shannon Davenport is on the phone from Esther is on the line. It, even if you don't have money to spend on those, um, just basically set up your Pinterest feed on Shopify, right? At least your, your whole shop will be in there. Um, set up your um, Microsoft Bing, believe it or not, actually has some really good uh, has a good app now where you can where you can set that up. Um, same thing with Google. So you can get those free shopping listings if you're even if you're just starting out as a new brand, definitely get all your uh, shopping feeds done if you do nothing else and then at least you're showing up in those places um, even if you're not paying for you know big dollars for ads. I love it. Such great advice. Okay, so one last question for you. When it comes to SEM, how long does it typically take to see results? Um, with search engine marketing, like overnight, you know, we um, we just started working with a new skincare company and we launched their ads and they got four purchases within the first two days. I mean, this is a brand that was not doing more than $5,000 a month before we took them on. So it, I'm like an instant gratification person. So, I mean, I, I got to give Tracy, Tracy Wallace must be the most patient person in the world because SEO does take a little bit, right? You're not going to get on Google on page one. You're not going to get on Amazon on page one unless you pay. So I think it really fits my personality. My Enneagram is an eight. I'm like, be smart, be bright, be gone. And so, you know, transactional advertising is exactly where I should be spending my life's work. I, I can look at what I did yesterday and see how much money I made for a brand and, and that just that's my passion. Well, good thing I know what to buy you for Christmas, Carolyn. <laughs> Get me the Enneagram 8 gift. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find the picture. I took it. I'll send it over to you. <laughs> Can't wait to see it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. Such great words of wisdom. And we are going to move on to our second Sean of the panel, Sean Donovan. He's the founder and CEO of Antidote, which is email marketing. So Sean, take it away. Tell us about Antidote. Um, and what you're doing in the email marketing game. So my name is Sean Donovan. I, uh, I originally was on the brand side of things, first starting an apparel brand um, many years ago. And then ultimately I ended up at VF running a couple of footwear lines before leaving Vans to launch a natural personal care brand. Um, and about three months into that, got into a trademark opposition lawsuit with Mary Kay, which ultimately took me into more consulting across all of marketing. But the way that I kind of entered into email and SMS and more retention-based marketing um, was basically learning through what I didn't do within my own brand and then seeing how effective and profitable email specifically was on a group of brands that I was working on um, when I first started consulting. And I just, I noticed how profitable it was. And I thought it was so interesting that it always got left to be the last uh, aspect of marketing that brands would work on, which is definitely what happened with me on, uh, on my own brand as well. And I think the, probably the main reason is um, when you're starting a brand, it's inspiring and um, creatively inspiring to think about how you're going to attract new audiences and find and nurture new audiences. And it's um, almost seems too simple to market to people who already have expressed that they're interested in your brand and or your product and try to bring them back more often than they might come back if you weren't talking to them in a consistent manner. Okay, so 
let's dig into this. So email marketing may not sound as sexy as like TikTok and Instagram, but like, why is it such an important part of the marketing mix? And I mean, I can think about it from my own personal experience. I scroll, I like get hooked on something on Instagram. I put it in my cart. I don't have my credit card around me and it's requiring some sort of information and, and there it stays. And then I wonder why it doesn't, you know, show up at my house a week later. Um, but I realized I never checked out. I feel like emails are just such a different level of engagement, just like even physically where I am when I get them. Yeah, I think there's a few main reasons. One is, especially nowadays with all brands driving paid traffic to their sites, email and, and SMS marketing, you have a chance to create a direct line of communication with the people that you're driving to your site. So if they don't convert on the first visit and first experience with the brand, you have an opportunity to continue talking to them, continue marketing to them, and eventually converting them into a paying customer, which would be the first uh, step. And then after that, you also create a, like a longer term relationship building opportunity where you can bring them back more often than they might come back if you weren't reminding them about the brand and product. And um, I would say that's one of the main reasons. And then the other reason is really based on even organic social, like it is your audience, but it's also not your audience because you're relying on the platforms who somewhat control who, who your uh, messaging is getting presented to. And email and SMS is an owned marketing channel where you really control what messages you're putting out and who generally you're targeting to see those, those campaigns. I love it. Okay, so some really tactical questions. Like, how do you go about building a successful email marketing campaign? And then just to add in some of the chatter, um, like what are the best hooks in a short email and like how emotional should you get? So what, how do you gauge the correct email marketing campaign for a company? I think from starting from the, uh, foundation, you can set up and you should set up simple automated flows. I think in the beginning of a brand, like you should do what's feasible for you to build on your own. And you, I don't think you should hire a group like ours, in all honesty. You should focus all of your efforts on acquisition and you should set up a base foundation to, to uh, communicate with them over email. If you bring them in through paid ads, you should have simple foundational automated flows for when they sign up for your list. You can present them with specific offers that make it more enticing for them to get on your list. And I think the other aspect of it is that, um, in my opinion, you should think about it from a brand first perspective and really look at the audience as if it's an opportunity to build a long-term relationship with that person. I don't think there's any hacks uh, in life, unfortunately. And I, I think you should be approaching it to provide value um, depending on what your brand specifically is like for Sean who spoke earlier, I think the level of humor and um, fun involved with the brand, like that's an opportunity to stand out from other brands in email specifically, because I think most brands, this is changing now with iOS 14, the, the challenges that that has presented has pushed people to be more creative with an email, but it's still not something that most brands spend a uh, huge amount of time on. Even larger brands that we work with, they, their creative teams are more inspired to do uh, creative work in other channels. We just try to make emails feel, for our team specifically, like they're working on almost like a web, a mini web page, so that it is like a full branded experience and that you are telling deeper stories rather than just sending transactional messages all the time. So I think there's a balance between uh, communicating for the sake of capturing a sale and then also for the sake of building brand and additionally capturing, an, capturing a sale. 
Okay, that's so great. And I mean, could you just elaborate on this change um, in the iOS system? Because I might not be aware of exactly what it is. Yeah, so like Carolyn was saying, just the loss in uh, data aggregation within Facebook and Instagram and uh, tracking abilities, and specifically for who you're targeting your ads to uh, appear for, because the acquisition costs are now rising with those challenges, it becomes more important to gather uh, any contacts of people that are coming to the site but might not convert. Because in the long run, you're raising uh, your ROI on paid ads if you are converting more of those people over time, regardless of if they purchase on day one or if they end up purchasing from the brand like a month, two months later. Okay. That's great information. Okay, so questions from the audience. How do you create a great email marketing content list? So specifically for content, I think it really is dependent on the brand, like uh, A, what your product is, and B, what the differentiating factors of your brand are and kind of overall tone and and voice that you're communicating on other channels. I would approach it um, in a way like trying to balance between sales focus and also brand focused content. And again, that's just trying to provide more value to the, to the audience so that you're not burning the list that you spend so much time and money building. Um, I think if you're too short-term focused, Obviously, people are going to become unengaged with the content you're putting out, and it's the same. It's the same across any platform. If if your focus on Instagram is purely to get people to buy the product, and you're always marketing the product and hitting people in the face with why they need to buy your product, they're not going to have the level of interest or connection with your brand that you would hope for. So. Uh, while it is such a great direct sales channel, you want to be cautious about doing purely sales-based content with an email so that you are creating long-term relationships with the people that are on your list. I love it. Okay, so that leads me to the next question. What are some best practices you can give um, on email marketing, especially Frequency, A-B testing. I mean, one question that just came in um, on the chat was um, informative emails and transactional emails. Um, you know, if you're a snack company, should it be on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? Like, how do you think about all of that? So I think it's, it's far different for different scale brands, first off. Uh, I would say to start, you should try to, it depends on your experience level within a tool that you're using, but you should start to look at your audience within segments. And uh, segmenting your audience helps you target what types of campaigns would be most relevant to the people that you're sending them to. And the main reason that you wanna do that is because you want your audience to be highly engaged with the content that you're sending. So you don't wanna send a campaign to somebody that you already know that type of person would not be interested in the campaign that you're sending. So the first part of it is really like caring about the audience and what you're sending to them to make sure that it's something that they potentially are interested in. An example of that would be like, uh, if you were sending a sales heavy product-based email, you should probably exclude people that purchase that specific product within X time period before that campaign goes out so that you're not hitting them with another uh, sale based message when they've already bought that within the past two, three weeks or whatever time period feels relevant for the brand. Um, and then Beyond that, remind me of the question, by the way, sorry. <laughs> it was just like best practices, frequency, frequency oh, yes, yes, yes. testing. And Carolyn just said something really interesting in the chat feature where, you know, she did a test from like an abandoned cart perspective. Like one was four hours after they abandoned the cart, one was one hour. And it was just interesting, you know, what changed with 
totally. somebody's going in and finishing checking out. I think for newer brands, outside of segmentation, like and understanding the type of people that you have on your list as a first step, uh, for newer brands, I think more than anything, you should build first off, build automated flows based on simple events that people are, uh, or simple actions people are taking on your site. So if somebody signs up for a list, make sure that you follow up with them after um, encouraging them to make their first purchase. If they make their first purchase, what are you sending to them at that point in their customer journey that's relevant to them that might help encourage them to have a great experience with the product that they did buy? Um, in terms of how often should you be sending one-off campaigns that are outside of automated flows. Again, that's far different based on the size and scale of the brand and also the size of your list. For newer brands, I think the most important thing is to uh, create a calendar and a schedule that you can stick to and to send campaigns consistently so that you have information that you're testing based on and you can find what works best and what doesn't work for your specific situation. And then just make small adjustments based on uh, what you're seeing success within. I think the dangers that I see is specifically with newer brands who probably should not be spending money on retention based marketing in the early days because it's more important to uh, be focused on acquisition obviously acquisition has the opportunity to exponentially grow your business if you're spending too much time and resources on retention in that phase um, retention is great but your list is not going to grow exponentially if you don't have new traffic coming to the site uh, and so for for brands like in that phase, the danger that I see is that they get too caught up in the idea of um, having a perfect retention marketing strategy or wanting to know all of the tricks up front. And in reality, there is no answer. There's no one answer for any brand. And you can simply try things and adjust based on the results that you're seeing. And more important than anything is just to be consistently sending campaigns out through the channel so that you're not ignoring the list that you've worked so hard to build. And also the, the traffic that you've acquired that you're actually taking advantage of that, even if they don't purchase on the first visit, which probably most people are not going to, to purchase. Such great information. Uh, can I add a rule of thumb um, and just something for every brand on the phone to know? You probably know this information already, but try and understand what percent of your people purchase. Um, usually our rule of thumb is less than $100. Normally more than 80% of people purchase within the first 24 hours. So, you know, you want, the, you want two or three abandoned carts to go out within one day because typically if you don't get them, then they're gone, right? Um, brands that we work with that have a thousand dollar AOV, you're not going to buy, you're not going to drop a thousand dollars on a cargo carrier for your SUV on day one. So we, we sort of have a, a longer educational type, you know, message But like Sean said, building out your list, you know, definitely link up. If you're on Clavio, link up your Clavio and your Facebook and run lead gen campaigns. So people who are engaging with your content on Facebook or Instagram, you can, you can integrate those with Clavio and then they go right into your automated flows and they get all these terrific emails that Sean and team do. So that's one way we, we do a lot of list building sometimes in October before ads get really expensive in November and December. But once they're on your email list, you know, you can, you can talk to them, you own that name, you have that first party data. So yeah. if you're not doing some list building now, maybe do it while well, it's still relatively cheap. And now is really like four the, more days in October. Yeah. Now is really like our uh, ramp up time. This is a busy time of you. I feel like every time of year is a busy time of year for us. But right now is like the mecca of uh, owned marketing channels because you've already done all the work to acquire uh, all of the brands that we work with have been spending. Uh, 
resources on paid acquisition. And now they, all the work that they've done, we're trying to capitalize on that throughout all of the holiday time period. I love it. Such great information. So for anyone who just joined in the last few minutes, we had like a glitch go out with our Eventbrite. So we're recording this presentation. We'll send it out. But I want to give people an opportunity to ask any questions that they may have on this topic um, as we kind of wrap up this call, knowing we went over late. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all the speakers and your words of wisdom, both from the struggles of, you know, skew companies who are just trying to figure it out as they grow to just some experts who really go deep in it. I feel like there was a lot of great information that came away with this. Um, from this um, town hall. So thank you everyone. And just to let kind of the broader community know, SKU has two amazing um, spring programs that will be launching Austin in January, Atlanta in February. So please, if you're interested to be in being a mentor, reach out spots are filling up real quick. If there's a great brand we should be talking to, um, let us know. Um, applications are open, but we will be closing them soon. Okay, so some questions coming in from Drake. Sean, um, do you recommend buying an email contact list? Um, I've heard it's not worth the ROI. Um, I personally definitely do not recommend buying email lists. I, again, like, I don't think there's hacks in order to build an engaged audience, even doing, um, certain brands have a lot of success with giveaways and building their lists through giveaways. Typically the easier it is for you to gather more contacts probably also means that they're not, um, the highest quality contacts either. Obviously they're not signing up because they're initially interested in buying the product or buying from the brand they're signing up because they want something else so i think the best way to build a highly engaged audience is typically uh, a long game also i mean i agree i'm the stickiness of a a real customer that's going to improve velocity um who wants to emotionally engage is so much more valuable yeah. The other, the other detail is that if you were to buy a list, um, let's say you bought a list of 10,000 people that they are not expecting you to reach out to them from that brand, the risk of that is that your domain is actually attached to your sender reputation. Like, so if you, if you um, sent to an audience that doesn't want to hear from you, it will ding your sender reputation. And if you ever move providers, like if you moved off of Clavio to MailChimp, potentially as like some people might think that that would be a solution to get away from the a poor sender reputation that they had built. The sender reputation goes with you wherever you go based on it being attached to your domain. So I would be cautious about trying any quick fixes like that because they'll come back in the long run. Really good to know. I'm probably dinging a lot of companies as I like use it as my morning routine just to clear out my end. Yeah. I feel yeah. like I'm more control and just deleting everything. Okay, yeah. so a couple of more questions coming in. Is there any real value in retaining influencers on a monthly basis? Um, and then a little bit of a follow-up on this as I'm just scamming it. Um, influencers that are you know, specific for a product line, you know, whether it be sustainability, um, are they beneficial to engage with? I feel like this is a great question for Tracy and um, I'm not sure, Ruth, have you used any influencer um, kind of agreements? Do you do it yeah. at hoc or on a monthly basis? Yeah, so we have, um, we, we found that micro influencers, so accounts that are anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 work well for us because they're not asking for, typically they'll do posts for products at that point and they're not asking for payment. 
um, but you do need a lot of them. So a tool we use is called Dovetail. Um, it's pretty cost effective. A lot of other options out there are quite expensive. Um, and you can just have them apply to your affiliate program or your ambassador program through Dovetail. They can upload content there. You can track all the purchases they drive to your site to see how they're performing. And then if they do well, um, for us at least, we give them points based on actions they take. So if they post um, that month, they get like, say like 10 points. If they comment, they get X points and all those points tally up to prizes that we then issue on Dovetail. So it makes it a really fun, engaging way without spending a lot on the influencers. And then you can also track how they're doing, performing, are they active, are they not? Um, and so that's just a good way to avoid like getting into some type of retainer agreement where you're giving them, you know, money each month, but they might not be active. And then you have to go back to them and explain that you want to kind of revoke their retainer. Such good practical information. I would just literally copied that chat um, sentence because I was sitting, I have an email sitting in my inbox, somebody asking that question. I'm like, ah, I got the answer. <laughs> Um, that's so great. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, any other last thoughts from the group as this conversation has really just touched on a lot of different aspects? Carolyn, thank you so much for all of your wisdom. You always have such practical tips and tools um, for founders to use. I mean, Sean, I feel like you need to talk with SKU because we should be getting better at our email marketing. Um, and I think everybody can always improve on what we're doing. Um, Tracy, your brilliance when it comes to content. Ruth and Sean, congratulations for all of your success and being part of this um, darling SKU alumni group.